More than 1,300 years after the first accounts of the travel on the Silk Roads, these fabled routes that had fallen into disuse had revived by the 8th and 9th centuries. The land route of the Silk Roads was vibrant and essential to interregional trade in the 14th and 15th centuries. Demand for luxury goods increased in Europe and Africa. Chinese, Persian, and Indian artisans and merchants expanded their production of textiles and porcelains for export. Caravans made travel safer and more practical, and the Chinese developed a system using paper money to manage increasing trade. Interregional trade on the Silk Roads flourished. The Crusades helped pave the way to expanding network of exchange as lords and their armies of knights brought back fabrics and spices from the east. Despite the inroads on the Byzantine Empire by the Ottoman Turks, the Silk Road's trade routes remained in operation, as did sea routes across the Mediterranean Sea and the Indian Ocean. China was still eager for Europe's gold and silver, and Europe was growing more eager than ever for silk, tea, and rhubarb. Global trade increased. Although Europeans had not yet found a route around the Cape of Good Hope at the southern tip of Africa, they had been making overland trips across Europe for many centuries. After the collapse of classical civilizations such as the Roman and Han empires, the first golden age of the Silk Roads came to an end, and activity declined dramatically. However, by the 8th and 9th century, Arab merchants from the Abbasid Empire revived the land route of the Silk Roads, as well as sea routes in the Indian Ocean. Tang China had much to offer the newly revived global trade network, including the compass, paper, and gunpowder. China exported porcelain, tea, and silk. From other parts of Asia, China imported cotton, precious stones, pomegranates, dates, horses, and grapes. These luxury goods appealed to the upper class of Chinese society, whose members reveled in the country's newfound affluence. This period marked the second golden age of the Silk Roads. No other cause, however, had as significant an impact on the expansion of trade as did the rise of the Mongol Empire. Mongols conquered the Apisad Caliphate in 1258, and in the 14th century, China came under their control as well. Parts of the Silk Roads that were under the authority of different rulers were, for the first time, unified in a system under the control of an authority that respected merchants and enforced laws. The Mongols improved roads and punished bandits, both of which increased the safety of travel on the Silk Roads. New trade channels were also established between Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and Europe. Those who survived the conquest by the Mongols and their descendants benefited from the reinvigoration of trade routes that had not been heavily used since the days of the Roman and Han empires. Another cause for the expansion of exchange networks was the improvement of transportation. Travelers on the overland Silk Roads learned that traveling with others in caravans was safer than traveling alone. They also learned how to design saddles for camels that greatly increased, increased the weight of the load of the animals could carry. Centuries later, China had made advances in naval technology that allowed it to control sea-based trade routes in the South China Seas. During the Han Dynasty in 200 AD, Chinese scientists developed the magnetic compass and improved the rudder, both of which helped na aid navigation and ship control along the seas. The Chinese junk also developed in the Han Dynasty was a boat similar to the Southwest Asian Dao. It had multiple sails and was as long as 400 feet, at least triple the size of the typical Western European ship of its time. The whole of the junk was divided into compartments. The walls making these divisions strengthened the ship for rough voyages at sea 
and made sinking less likely. Two significant effects on the expansion and stability of the Silk Roads were the series of oases that developed along the routes, including thriving cities and commercial innovations that greatly helped to manage the increasing trade. Long stretches of the overland Silk Roads passed through inhospitable terrain, hot, arid lands where water was scarce, Cities along the routes that were watered by rivers became thriving centers of trade. For example, the city of Kashgar is located at the western edge of China, where the northern and southern routes of the South Silk Roads cross, leading to destinations in Central Asia, India, Pakistan, and Persia. It sits where the Talkman Khan Desert meets the Tian Shan Mountains and is watered by the Kashgar River, which has made the lands along it fertile for crops such as wheat, rice, fruits, and cotton. Travelers on the Silk Roads depended on Kashgar for its abundance of water and food. Artisans in Kashgar produced textiles, rugs, leather goods, and pottery. Its food and handcrafts were sold in a bustling market. At the crossroads of both ideas and goods, the once primarily Buddhist city also became a center of Islamic scholarship. Here is the land of Sumarkan. Similarly, like Kashgar, Sumarkan was a very large city. It is located in present-day Uzbekistan, and it was a stopping point on the Silk Roads between China and the Mediterranean. Sumarkan was a center of cultural exchange as much as it was a center for trading goods. Archaeological remains show the presence of diverse religions, including Christianity, Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and Islam. Like Kashgar, Samarkand was known for its artisans as well as its centers of Islamic learning and magnificently decorated mosques. Large flourishing trading cities such as Kashgar and Samarkand, however, were not the only oasis along the arid Silk Roads. Once the roots of the Silk Roads became stabilized, Inns known as Karasari sprang up often about a hundred miles apart. That distance is how far camels could travel before they needed water. At the inn, travelers could rest both themselves and their animals and sometimes trade their animals for fresh ones. The word Karavansari derives from the Persian words for caravan and palace. To manage the increasing trade, China developed new financial systems. China had long been a money economy, using money rather than bartering with such commodities as cowrie shells or salt. However, the copper coins they used became too unwieldy to transport for everyday transactions, so the government developed a system of credit known as flying cash. This allowed a merchant to deposit paper money under his name in one location and withdraw the same amount at another location. Locations for exchanging flying cash became the model for the banks of the modern era, including the banking houses established in European cities in the 1300s. At a banking house, a person could present a bill of exchange and document stating the holder was legally promised payment of a set amount on a set date and receive that money in exchange. Each of these innovations encouraged and supported trade by providing convenience and the stability of institutions. The Crusades awakened Europeans' interest in luxury goods from Asia. To acquire them, they organized the trade of European resources. In the 13th century, cities in northern Germany and Scandinavia formed a commercial alliance called the Hanseatic League. Controlling trade in the North Sea and the Baltic Sea, member cities of the League, such as Lübeck, Hamburg, and Riga, were able to drive out pirates and monopolize trade in goods such as timber, grain, leather, and salted fish. League ships would leave the Baltic and North Seas. They would round the Atlantic coast of Western Europe, proceeding to the ports of the Mediterranean. 
There they might pick up valuable goods from the Arab caravans. The league lasted until the mid-17th century when national governments became strong enough to protect their merchants. This is an example of the innovations in commerce from 500 BCE to 600 CE. As you can see, coins were first minted as early as 500 BCE right here in a place called Lydia, which was actually a Greek colony at the time, but it's located in Turkey today. The earliest inns were found in the Persian Empire in 500 BCE as well, and then spread up to the Silk Road over time. Paper money is going to be used during the Tang Empire in China as early as 800. The Hanseatic League is going to be formed by the 1200s and last till 1600. Banking houses show up in China and slowly over time expand and bills of exchange become commonplace. The growing demand for luxury goods from Afro-Eurasia, China, Persia, and India led to a corresponding increase in the supply of those goods through expanded production. Craft workers expanded their production of such goods as silk and other textiles and porcelains for export. Increased demand also led to the expansion of iron and steel manufactured in China, motivating its proto-industrialization. When you study a historical development or process, you place it within a larger historical perspective, a bigger picture. Sometimes to get this perspective, you look at the causes of a development or process. For example, the historical development for intercultural connections was possible in the classical era because of interregional trade along the Silk Roads. In the bigger picture, these intercultural connections bridged the East and the West and began the foundations of a global economy and community.